Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Domestic Gaze Live. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, and so I'm just going to provide a brief contextual introduction to this event, and then we'll go into the conversation. So for many of us, March marks one year since the start of confinements, lockdowns, and curfews. Within that year, rates of domestic violence and violence against women have reached record highs in the US, the UK, and France. And the UN has declared without drastic action, the pandemic could set back women's rights by decades. Despite this, uh, the hope for a new and better world in the first lockdown. One year later, women's rights, particularly for women of color, are still under threat. So nearly a year after our podcast series, we're honored to welcome Alexis Hoag, the predict, uh, practitioner uh, in residence at the Holder Initiative for Civil and Political Rights at Columbia University. Terry McGovern, the chair of the Halbrin Department of Population and Family Health, and Vipu Krishna, a medical student at Columbia University's Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons, in conversation to, to, together to discuss what has and hasn't changed since their initial episodes. Before we begin, I'd like to say a big thank you to the Halbrin Department of Population and Family Health, the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought, and the Women's March Paris chapter for sponsoring our event today. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them in the Q&A box below. Uh, and so to begin. Uh, so March is the month of women's, it's Women's History Month. And within this month is also International Women's Day. And yet we've seen throughout this month, constant violence against women. So at the beginning of the month, Sarah Everard in the UK went missing. And then it was found out that she was murdered. Uh, and in Mexico, feminicide rates have gone up this month and there's been huge uh, protests against this. And then just this week, we've seen multiple Asian women murdered by a white man in Atlanta. And so Alexis, I was wondering if you could start today's uh, conversation with, uh, you know, uh, is, is violence against women something that we just have to accept? Is it something that uh, is going to be punished or because it seems I think for women many women that it's gone on so long that it feels unchanging. Sinead thank you so much for opening uh, with that question um, and I also just want to thank you for um, you organizing this event in the Columbia Global Centers. Uh, it's, a, it's a real privilege and an honor to be in conversation with you and Terry and Vipu um, and I these are such important issues um, and I remember when you first approached us about uh, coming together to be back in conversation, we thought, you know, what, what, what has changed? So much has remained static, you know, through this year uh, with, with the pandemic, uh, but yet just these last few weeks, you've mentioned these instances that have really underscored um, why we need to spend time talking about the particular type of vulnerability that, that society in the US and abroad creates for women. Um, and you said, is this something we have to accept? Is violence against women something that's going to be punished? Um, I, I wanna spend a moment just recognizing why it is that women in particular are, are so much more vulnerable to this kind of violence. And I think this, the sort of things that can keep women safe are what we lack. And it's because of, of these sort of structural forces that keep women from, from having a living wage and access to a living wage. And we see the loss of jobs, particularly in the United States during COVID, disproportionately impacting women. Uh, the fact that women don't have access to childcare, which then allows them to pursue education, which then allows them to pursue jobs that could offer them a living wage, don't have access to safe housing, don't have access to healthcare. And then women in particular are put in positions in which they are dependent on a, a caregiver, often a man who has greater access to these things. Or they're forced to work in situations in which makes them unsafe. Whether that's the time in which they work, and so they're off of work in, in, in uh, uh, late at night, uh, or in communities in which they're, they, they don't have as much safety. Um, so all of this is sort of at play in, in these instances of, of violence against women that you um, I want to spend just a moment talking about um, the shooting in Atlanta, and we're learning so much more about it as, as moments progress. And so what I have to say today, what we have to say today may change next week. What we do know is that eight people were killed 
Seven of them were women, six of them were Asian. And even though the person that is seen as responsible for this, this shooting, these, these murders, says it's not about race, we know that the vast majority of the victims were Asian. And, and we can't ignore the larger context in which these murders occurred, which is with this sharp increase in violence against Asian Americans. And a lot of the rhetoric that's happened in the United States with the coronavirus and a, and a false association with, uh, with China or with Asia. In New York City alone, which I know is where we are, we are all, uh, the speakers at least here in, in New York City, we have a 1,900% increase in violence against Asians. 1,900% in this last year. And so we can't, we can't compart compartmentalize that uh, from what happened in Atlanta. And also this long history, particularly in the US, of anti-Asian uh, laws um, beginning in the, the 1800s. Asians were brought to the United States primarily as laborers. And some of the first exclusionary laws targeted Asian women who were thought to be immoral and engaging in sex work. Um, and so this is long standing policies uh, long-standing discrimination. And so I know there's a lot to unpack um, and I really wanna hear from our co-panelists, but thank you so much for opening uh, with, with those, those, um, those instances of violence. Yeah, because I think it's something that is on everyone's minds right now, especially in terms of the significance of it happening within this month too. In any month, it's awful, but in a month that's specifically dedicated to women, it's pretty shocking. And Vipu and Terry, I mean, what Alexis has just said, it really highlights the importance of intersectionality too, because it's not just that they're women who's murdered, it's that they're Asian women. And it's uh, it's this link between race and gender and this kind of terrorism against it through domestic terrorism. And I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about the importance of intersectionality that's kind of, I think people are becoming more and more aware of the more these things happen. Yeah, um, I would be happy to to start. I I will I'll draw us back to to that Kimberly Crenshaw quote that we discussed during the podcast episode. Um, comes from Mapping the Margins, and she she said cultural patterns of oppression are not only interrelated but are bound together and influenced by the intersectional systems of society, and like it's just that holds so true. Um, I can speak to kind of the medical and public health aspect of it, and intersectionality in medicine comes into play at every single level. There's the patient level, provider level, and then the community at large. So who gets treatment when and why, or no treatment at all? Who has higher mortality rates? Who feels the most safe confiding in clinicians, um, even seeking help in the first place? Which clinicians themselves rise to which positions? Um, all of this is, is intersectional. And then also the disease landscape itself is, is intersectional. Um, and so, so that's something that has kind of held true throughout this pandemic and has been exposed even further um, in the last year. And Terry, I mean, you started your career uh, dealing with HIV in, in the AIDS pandemic. And in your podcast episode, you mentioned that Black women were far more disproportionately affected by this, the discrimination against this. And um, they weren't even thought about in most cases. And I think that's another thing that we're seeing uh, even one year after the pandemic, it's continuing and even getting worse. Yes, first of all, let me also thank you. This has really been a, a great experience and it's really an honor to be with these two colleagues in this discussion, but I really appreciate your attention and care around this whole um, kind of series. So thank you, Sinead. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I also like the fact that all three of us have actually been service providers, lawyers, doctors. Um, it kind of imprints something on you that you never forget. Um, and I remember that when I started realizing that there was something wrong with the AIDS definition, that my clients were dying, mostly women of color, before they ever got AIDS, but they had HIV. Um, I remember some of the impact litigators saying to me, how did you notice this huge thing? I was like, well, it walks in in the form of a, a woman. 
Um, so intersectionality is housed in the bodies of the people that we're talking about. Um, so so on the on the HIV uh, back way back when, because of structural racism and structural misogyny, they didn't adequately study how HIV was affecting women. Um, that meant gynecological disease was left out. It meant all kinds of converging epidemics were, were over, overlooked. From the beginning, prison populations, jail populations were never part of the planning, uh, homeless populations. So we see uh, this again in COVID, right? We see, you know, we see, we know that there's day, everyday racism in the medical care system, um, but we see it, you know, exploiting, we see this virus exploiting long standing, you know, systemic racism, right? Redlining has led to housing conditions, the overplacement of really, really toxic industries and communities of color. All of these things lead to underlying disease burden that really made COVID uh, easily, easily exploited, able to exploit uh, these kind of conditions. Um, so I feel like sadly, it's a lot of the same themes in COVID. The other thing I wanna say is that most of the women that I saw way back when, and I'm talking like 1987, Many of them had been incarcerated. Many of them had experienced some form of sexual or physical violence. Um, these epidemics go unaddressed, right? So it all comes to the, to the forefront in, in this pandemic because it's been there the whole time, um, unaddressed. So, so I think on the positive, uh, we have a lot stronger, uh, we, more people have an understanding of these issues than they used to. Uh, you have to say that uh, intersectionality was not really discussed in the way that it is now. So there are some positives, but um, sadly, a lot of memories uh, of HIV present in this pandemic. And, and just to pick up on where Terry and Vivi left off, um, Intersectionality was not acknowledged really until you know Kimberly Crenshaw, who Vibu spoke about, uh, coined this term in the late 80s. Um, and I think all of us can express gratitude and do express gratitude for her elevating, acknowledging, and recognizing the unique way that people are made up of multiple identities. Yeah. yeah. Gender, ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, and that these are not mutually exclusive. And that these identities then intersect and form a whole, which differ from the singularly held identities. And so what Kimberly Crenshaw has allowed us to do is, is recognize that and then use intersectionality as a prism that can help us then in, uh, inform our advocacy, our policy, treatment, practice in a way uh, that, that will ultimately encourage greater equity. Um, and, and it's it seems like such a simple notion now, like, ah, of course, <laughs> being a woman, being a woman of color is different than just being a woman, than different than just being uh, you know, a person of color. And there's a unique and distinct experience when those two identities um, intersect. Uh, but it was, as Terry said, it was not really discussed. It was not acknowledged. Um, and this notion you know, that we, uh, we can't compartmentalize these identities and examining the very real harm that the, the overlay of these, these identities experience. And would you say that the reason that it wasn't so, say, intersectionality wasn't so obvious before, maybe because, uh, you know, um, the medical system and the criminal legal system, it was set up to make you actually compartmentalize people's race and gender and all of this and not view in an intersectional, intersectional way. Do you think that that may be something that's at play? Yes, everything was set up that way. I mean, I, you know, funding donors were set up that way. I, I remember, you know, at the Ford Foundation, there's a gender justice, a racial justice, uh, immigrants' rights. It, it's all intersecting, right? So, yes, big yes. 
<laughs> yeah, and you, you can't look at these as siloed issues. I, you know, when I, before academia, I worked for the, the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP. And, and even though what we do is all racial justice, we got rid of our siloed practice groups um, because you have issues within the criminal legal system that spill over into economic justice, that spills over into education, that spills over into all these other sort of more general civil rights issues. Um, and I think that's that's true of many advocacy organizations now, understanding that you have to have a holistic approach. Because if you look at issues and address issues in a siloed fashion, you're going to miss out on how best to, to offer services um, and how best to combat sort of these structural issues that perpetuate the subordination of people with intersected identities. I will say, I think like all of that is true and we have all of these like additional check boxes now in, on medical forms and things like that, but that hasn't necessarily fully translated yet to like the interpersonal level and like our own like unconscious biases and the way that like we interact with other people, even if we have these kind of other options there. Um, and I think that even like has shown in the way data has been collected about the pandemic, about like vaccine uptake and hesitancy. And um, that's like, I guess the next step. It's like, now that we've expanded the options, how do we also, you know, have people really internalize that and then act accordingly. Um, and it, you know, to me, that's like the next step in, in improving disparities in care mm -hmm. and a challenging one. Mm -hmm. And these are nuanced issues. I mean, I think about the criticism uh, or the assumption rather that, that, that black people in particular would be hesitant to get the vaccine. And I think when you like peel back some of the layers of what's actually going on, on the ground, it's more about access. So it's not that black people don't want to get the vaccine. It's that in terms of being able to, to navigate the appointment system, being able to physically get yourself to a vaccination center, getting childcare, time off of work. Uh, so it's a much more nuanced issue. And I'm, I'm so glad Viv, you um, brought that up. And yes, to, just to add quickly, I mean, I think what we saw at the Armory on 168th Street in New York City when we first opened, because uh, it was really every white person in the five boroughs seemed to be showing up. And just with the concentrated effort to actually get to community members to, to address the issues that Alexis just described, we saw a big change immediately. So these are not insurmountable issues, right? People just need to think a lot differently. Um, and just to say, and plan differently, right? Because because we have seen just a catastrophic failure to plan for what has happened to women and women of color in this pandemic, right? Across the board. Um, so. And yes, so thank you for bringing up planning, Terry, because I think something that uh, has become very clear is that with this kind of pandemic and this crisis, the male leaders of Western countries have approached it as a war. And so Macron even said, nous sommes en guerre, saying we are at war. Um, and so something that I find very interesting is a lot, of, a lot of women in response to that said, actually, we're in a crisis of care. And I'm wondering, do you agree that this isn't a, a war, this is a crisis of care and approaching it as a war, do you find that helpful? I mean. <laughs> I, so it's a very complicated and uh, question because I think like the word frontline itself, which is in all of, you know, tons of literature articles, like the CDC <laughs> uses it, um, is reminiscent of warlike language. And then there are numerous healthcare workers that you know self-describe as this and use this word. And then you have the imagery of like suiting up in uniform, scrubs, layers of PPE, and combating something potentially lethal. Um, and so you know, you think, okay, maybe this sort of analogy could be apt. But then if you kind of break it down further, there's aspects of this sort of imagery that like are probably not serving us. Um, and, and so to your point, detracting from this key element of it being a crisis of care, um, and like we said, exposing cracks in the system across so many different levels, the disproportionate effects of the disease, lack of infrastructure to get ahead of it in a prompt and efficient fashion. So, so when we call it a war, we are then kind of taking away from this more like humanizing aspect of it. And COVID has dehumanized so many. Um, and at the same time, also 
we draw national lines. So we have the unfortunate kind of labeling of it as the China virus by, by certain politicians. Um, we have countries not necessarily sharing information with one another or we're labeling variant strains by the nationality. Um, and I don't think these sorts of things engender a real sense of global unification, which is what we need to ultimately come, you know, revert to some sense of normalcy. Um, and so I think that is like one of the hardest parts for me is, is those like creations of national boundaries when this is truly a global issue. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, I, I mean, we knew from Ebola that GBV rates would escalate if you had a stay at home order, right? We knew that there's, there's so much written about how you should be thinking about as sexual and reproductive health services as essential gender-based violence, right? And what we saw was a total policy failure, both in the U.S. and globally. Uh, only due to activism did you know certain countries eventually say sexual and reproductive health services were essential. Um, so, so there's just a massive failure, and I do want to talk about the leadership issue for a second, but I also want to say. On the vaccine equity front, we have unabated, you know, kind of rich countries taking care of themselves um, without transparency about what it costs, um, you know, without transparency about deals being cut with pharmaceuticals, um, but not enough attention to building up countries' capacities to manufacture their own vaccines. So. Um, I don't know who the war is against, right? If 75% of, of, of homeless people, I'm sorry, in New York City, homeless people have a 75% higher chance of having died during COVID. We know the incarceration rate numbers are five times, 5.5 times higher. Who's the war against? Like we're overlooking very obvious things to, to, to address this pandemic. So um, I think, but I do want to say there are these, leaders, mostly women of color, who did and do understand kind of how to plan for these intersecting problems. And most of them were kind of thrown out of office one way or the other. I'm not going to name names, but we all know we've watched a whole bunch of white men fighting for airtime, fighting to get glory in this war against the pandemic. And we've seen women of color who really did know the answers um, kind of, so I think we need to think a lot about leadership and power and strategy. Um, so just to throw that in. Well, and don't you think that something that also comes out of this warlike strategy means that, well, all of the essential workers, they're doing us a favor, the people, the shopping, uh, the shopkeeping staff who have to go to work every day, or, you know, the UN um, and the who just, uh, the study that seven out of 10 women in the world are frontline workers. And uh, the majority are usually women of color too. And by using this warlike strategy, they're kind of framing this as they're doing their country a favor, they're doing a country the service. We don't need to give them a pay rise on all of this. I mean, do you, I mean, Alexis, do you think this is something that is perhaps happening? Oh, of, of course. Um, and I'm, I'm most, you know, privy to, to the dynamics and the demographics in New York City, uh, which in the United States has obviously been the epicenter of um, you know, the, the pandemic. And so many um, women and women of color in particular are um, home uh, health aides um, and are these frontline individuals uh, providing essential services to other people, but yet are, are still at risk um, of contracting the disease themselves um, and, and don't have that kind of access to a vaccination. Um, and I, I know just before we, we sort of went live to our audience, we talked about um, you know, the struggles of obtaining the vaccine in, in Europe. Um, and in New York City, it's, it's, it's complete disarray. Uh, there's, there's very little sort of information about a unified way to obtain an appointment um, and we obviously have this tiered system of eligibility, uh, but yet you still have people uh, who are the most marginalized or the most vulnerable to contracting the, the disease who still don't have access, even with this sort of tiered, tiered system. Um, and there are lots of anecdotes in the media of, of people who didn't seem to, to fit any of the eligible criteria at first. Lots of reports of vaccination sites not 
um, checking to ensure that the, the people that showed up to get a vaccine fit into the, to the, 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 the listed criteria when vaccinations first opened up. Um, and so, so yes, uh, very, very much so. And to kind of jump off of that, Alexis, in your podcast episode, you focused a lot on uh, uh, prisons and uh, incarceration. And I'm just interested in, you know, it, it, there's no one's really talking about vaccinating people in prison and making sure that they're safe too. And I'm just wondering what you could say about that and if you could go into that a little bit more. And also in terms of this language of war and versus this language of care that people are calling for, for black people, they've kind of lived with a language of violence and physical violence against them before the pandemic. And the pandemic, like Terry said earlier, is just highlighting this and exacerbating it. And so could you maybe go into this a little bit? Yeah, lots, lots to unpack there. So Terry already shared some of these statistics of incarcerated people's uh, increased vulnerability to contracting COVID-19 and then um, and dying from, from the disease. And, and prisons um, are, are really a, a petri dish uh, for this disease to flourish. Um, I still represent an individual who's incarcerated on federal death row. Um, and here you have the, the, the Trump administration um, really steamrolling through and increasing um, execution of people who are on federal death row in a way that we hadn't seen in, in over seven decades. And, and two of the most recent men that were executed by the federal government had contracted COVID-19. Um, and this is you know, at the tail end of Trump's presidency in, in early, um, early January. And the one woman that was executed uh, by the federal government, Lisa Montgomery, her two attorneys, my former colleagues, um, contracted COVID. Um, when they were, were, were going through and visiting uh, from Tennessee to Texas where Lisa was confined, and then once uh, Ms. Montgomery was moved to Indiana for execution, you know, having to, to do that kind of traveling, um, expose them at, at greater risk. So it's not just those that are incarcerated, but the family members who no longer can visit, the attorneys, all of the people uh, that rally around uh, folks who are incarcerated. Um, and and what, what we spoke about in the podcast, which I know we'll probably get more into, um, is, is the unique experience of women and, and women of color within a criminal legal system. Um, and I don't want to speak just about incarceration because yes, we are in this um, era of mass incarceration, but also mass criminalization. So it's not just the women that are confined to prison, but all the women that are under some sort of supervision of parole and probation. Um, and we speak so much about the increase of, of people in prison uh, during you know, these last uh, sort of 40, 50 years, but the population of incarcerated women has increased uh, 750%, which is greater than the increase of incarcerated men. Um, and that black women in particular um, have higher rates of incarceration uh, than other women, um, or white women in particular. And, and what else is unique about women who are incarcerated is they are overwhelmingly mothers. 80% uh, of incarcerated women are mothers. 60% have children under the age of 18. They're primary caretakers often of their children in a way that we don't see uh, with incarcerated men who may have children but aren't necessarily the primary caretakers. So you start seeing this multi-generational impact when you have incarcerated women that are no longer able to be that, that primary caretaker of their children. Women are, are more often targeted too for property and drug crimes. Um, than, than men. And so this is, again, this is unique experience of women within the criminal legal system. Um, and here we have, now that we have this, you know, exploded population of women incarcerated, uh, you know, as Terry has mentioned, it's really, uh, the pandemic has laid bare these existing structural issues. And so they are that much more vulnerable uh, to contracting uh, the disease while, in, while incarcerated and not getting the vaccination. Um, I was just talking to a client in Tennessee State Prison, maximum security, that they were supposed to get the vaccine last week, um, and there's a delay, and the correctional officers aren't wearing masks. They're supposed to, but they're not wearing masks, and they're not get, they're, they're refusing to get vaccinated. And so there's this gap now uh, with this population that doesn't have an option, really, to um, stay six feet apart. Uh, or have necessarily access to all of the uh, protective equipment barriers that would keep them safe. Can I just add, I mean, I think, um, I think, you know, 
one of the things that was so prominent in HIV was actually when there was a White House AIDS czar, et cetera, prisons and jails, incarcerated people were never part of the plan, right? And that's something that we know has driven the HIV epidemic among communities of color, but here we are doing it again, right? Purposefully overlooking uh, incarcerated people. I wanted to say something though about, uh, you know, what Alexis was saying about who are the women of color who are incarcerated. It was a lot of women who are no longer alive, black women who were the ones who first said there's something wrong with this AIDS definition. Um, and, uh, you know, I just then pulled together the legal means to, to bring a class action about it, but it was them um, and so when you really work with incarcerated women, you see they are the smartest, most resilient, most incredible women you can imagine. And, and it's just incredibly horrifying that they are not prioritized. In, and, and, and just as Alexis said, you know, when you deal with women, you're, you have to deal with all of these other issues, their children, their families, um, and, and and yet again, all these years later, we have to fight to get them recognized. Um, this is what needs to change. Like we can't keep being an afterthought, right? Um, and I think we may be on the brink of change, but um, to me, there's nothing more clarifying about the impacts of structural racism and sexism than to work with women who are incarcerated. <laughs> And uh, I, I think uh, what Alexis, what you just talked about too, and that Terry highlighted as well, is the uh, the generational impact that incarceration has. It links to the school to prison pipeline, which I think maybe we should get to in a second. But I just want to ask Vipu. Um, so in Alexis's talk related to what she's just been discussing, she also brought up uh, the presumption of dangerousness that women, uh, black women particularly, and black girls face in high school. And I'm wondering, because in your podcast episode, you mentioned that uh, there were multiple times when you were in the room and uh, you, the patient would refer to the man or the, you said the eye would always shift to the male in the room. And I'm wondering if you ever, if you have any experiences or through the faces of the front line, if you've got uh, any stories maybe that highlight this kind of, you know, discrimination against uh, women and women of color in the healthcare system. Yeah, um, I, thank you for bringing that up. And I, I think like, well, first and foremost, I think it's important to note women constitute like almost 80% of the healthcare workforce um, and about a third of current physicians. Um, and so of course, any of the already existing challenges that you face in medicine are gonna be exacerbated by a pandemic um, and by a crisis. There are several stories that we've heard come through from Faces of the Frontlines. Um, one specifically, which I, we haven't published yet, but um, from an Asian woman, she's a physician, and she basically writes that she was very used to people, patients asking her, where are you from, um, right off the bat. And that's happened to me too. Um, patients flirt with you, all of that kind of stuff that you just don't want to necessarily deal with in the workplace. Um, but then they went on to basically say that they weren't comfortable with her being the care provider because she was Asian. They were like, oh, do you have the virus? Essentially, like asking, do you have it? Did you bring it? Um, and that's, it's, it's truly horrific. I mean, it's, uh, you know, this person who's dealing with so much already, um, anxiety due to risk of exposure, probably playing a care, you know, disproportionately playing a caregiver role at home. Um, and then on top of that, kind of having to almost win over the trust of patients um, all over again because of this. Um, and so there's like kind of intersectional experiences um, all the time. And, you know, our, every type of minority woman, physician, healthcare worker has, has probably dealt with this um, at least once, if not several, several times um, every week, I would say. So it's, and, and I guess like on top of that, um, you know, to there's, there's longer hours, shorter breaks, your units are being repurposed, your job is being repurposed. Um, and then you are dealing with like this kind of additional layer of, of stress in your workday. Um, and I think, 
that's a really hard place to be in because you probably had to kind of fight to, tooth and nail just to get to that job position in the first place. So. No, thank you for sharing that, Bhikkhu. And so Alexis, I was wondering if maybe we could touch on the school to prison pipeline because I think we were getting at it with uh, the generational issues that come from uh, incarceration and the imprisonment of women, particularly of mothers. And what you talked about in your podcast, I think was really important. And I think a lot of people would learn from it too. And so if you could maybe go into that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so many of the issues that, that black children encounter in schools are what black people encounter in the criminal legal system. Um, and so society tends to assign a presumption of criminality and dangerousness to black people. Um, black people are seen as being more culpable and more deserving of punishment. And so you see that trickle down effect in schools. And what we know about black children in particular is that both black boys and girls are seen as chronologically older, as less needing of nurturing. Um, and all of these sort of forces acting together make them much more vulnerable uh, to discipline in school. And there has been some fantastic scholarship on this. And as Terry says, you know, I do, I do feel a little bit more hopeful because we are now naming the issue, we're calling it out, we're shedding light on it, which then helps us address policy and advocacy. Um, and so Monique Morris, um, uh, within the last five, 10 years, wrote this phenomenal book called Push Out, looking at the experience of, of Black girls and the criminalization of Black girls in schools. Um, LDF, the Legal Defense Fund, uh, just a few years ago looked at, at the experience of Black girls in Baltimore, in particular in public schools, and the experience of, of girls who are suspended, expelled disproportionately because of these subjective issues, so um, a dress code violation. They're seen as chronologically older, and so clothing is fitting more tightly, uh, shows skin, and so then they are, are actually suspended for a, a clothing violation uh, or for even wearing their hair naturally because it's seen as educationally disruptive. Um, and over half of the girls who are incarcerated, so this is um, not unrelated to the school to prison pipeline, but half of the girls who are incarcerated are done so because they've run away from home and so you think about some of these forces that make uh, children feel unsafe at home, and it can be uh, violence in the home, um, uh, all sorts of issues, and then we, yet we criminalize that. So it's not so much that we give, we give children safe places to live, uh, but yet we, we lock them up and confine them in these, in these pretty punitive environments. Um, research also shows that, uh, you know, Black boys are three times more likely to be pushed out of school, but black girls six times more likely than their white counterparts. And again, these are these greater forces that I'm talking about that are, uh, adults face um, because of society's sort of perception of black and brown children. Um, I know the Yale Child Study Center, this is um, studies maybe about 10 to 15 years old. Uh, it was like an eye tracking study of, of uh, teachers, uh, both black and white teachers. And the study found that uh, beginning in the preschool years, so I'm talking about children that are four, five, six years old, teachers will, will, will track black and brown students um, more than other students looking for students to act out. Um, and again, they are pushed out for subjective behavior. So it's you know, being disruptive. It's very clear when a student brings a, a weapon to school that that's something that should be addressed and disciplined. Uh, but what do you do about disruptive behavior? And that's where we see the disproportionate uh, number of, of children of color um, and girls being sort of pushed out. And so the fact that we now um, have research and scholarship on these issues, I think means that we can start changing the, the policies, um, start changing the way that teachers are being trained and the way that they look at discipline and actually putting protective measures in place. And part of that is removing law enforcement officials from schools uh, because I've, I've litigated in school districts where a school resource officer writes a student up for a, a school infraction and they don't go to the principal's office, they go to the county juvenile justice center. And then they get ensnarled in the criminal legal system as children, as, as young as, as, as primary school. Um, and this cycle does not end without some sort of um, intervention. I just, can I just add, I saw a question about trans women and I just wanted to say kind of across the board, we did a five country kind of rapid assessment of what was happening with 
violence, gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health and kind of across the board, you saw um, trans folks, LGBTQI kind of really marginalized, needs not addressed. So um, the question was, what about trans women? And I would just say everything's exponentially worse. Um, uh, and, and this of course is another issue of intersectionality, right? Um, <laughs> we need to be thinking about this when we think about everything else. So, um, because uh, for all the reasons we've been discussing, but just to say it's very clear um, that this is, you know, this is a huge problem. Thank you for bringing up the question. I just like to remind everyone that um, the Q and A box is there, so please submit any questions that you have, and we'll get to them. Um, Vipu, related to the to this trans question that Terry's brought up, I'm wondering if you know. I think you've shared a few uh, stories on Faces of the Frontline by a trans woman. I think you shared once, and I'm just wondering if you have anything to say about this too, because it's true that trans women are far more disproportionately impacted as well, and COVID has exacerbated this too. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we shared one story from a trans woman who was one of the first. Um, like kind of drive-by testers in, in DC area. And she was just sharing how proud she was to be in that position um, and how she felt like the representation was quite scarce. I think, you know, from given, you know, just right now I'm so entrenched in, in vaccination. Um, there's one thing that I feel like is really missing from these efforts and that is like adequate data reporting and collection. And, a lot of forms that people fill out. I mean, first of all, I think only half of people who've gotten vaccinated have had to have, have really had their kind of identity sort of have had the opportunity really to have these check boxes. And then which checks check boxes they're served are kind of site dependent, city dependent, state dependent. Um, but that's kind of, you know, one thing there's like all of this underreporting. So we can't even like truly adequately quantify what is going on with each of these demographic subpopulations. Um, so to me, that's kind of like a very clear way of, of just creating some action and some like quick routes to improving our, our reporting methodology. Um, another thing is like with respect to guidance on eligibility and high-risk groups for infection, um, clear data is still kind of missing from the CDC, um, especially for people who are pregnant. I mean, the language is still women who are pregnant or nursing. Um, it's it's not totally gender neutral language. Um, and then they're only, I think February 18th, I believe like so literally a month ago, uh, Pfizer finally kicked off a study to to trial vaccination in, in pregnant women. So there's like 4,000 women now in trial and that data isn't gonna be out until many of them have delivered seven to 10 months from now. So all of that to say, I think, you know, women and trans women have been like just really overlooked um, with respect to these efforts um, when it comes to data collection, reporting, eligibility criteria, and then, you know, also being included um, in all of these different types of, of groupings. Um, and that's just like a major way in which we can like quickly enact change. And Terry, in your podcast episode, you described this kind of these kinds of issues as pandemics within pandemics. And to kind of go back to the recent events that have happened this month uh, with Sarah Everard and with um, the women in Atlanta and the, the feminicides in Mexico, I'm just wondering, do you feel like the pandemic of male violence against women is being treated as importantly as the pandemic of COVID-19? I mean, I think we can guess the answer, but. No, it, you know, there's also been a longstanding uh, kind of, you know, disappearance and murder of indigenous women in the US, but also around the world. You know, I mean, like it's unbelievable. And there's all kinds of crazy jurisdictional issues about, who can, who can do what. Um, I think that, uh, that this has been ignored for so long um, that it's just, we're just focusing on it in this moment, but you know, the murders of women of color have been going on, you know, since the, since forever. Um, and I think um, 
you know, I, I just can't tell you how frustrating it is to, to know that there were so many things that could have been done policy-wise to prevent a lot of what's happened and nobody bothered to do it, which brings me back to the leadership question, right? Um, how can we change the leadership picture from this kind of patriarchal, you know, approach, use of the term war, uh, you know, hogging screen time rather than, you know, <laughs> talking to people in communities to ask them where the pop-up center should be. Um, you know, there's just this kind of arrogance of, of, you know, failing to talk to the people who know best how to address these complex problems. Um, and in gender-based violence, I mean, to go back to some of the, you know, it's, it's also not integrated in anything. It's also not necessarily a part of a gender justice portfolio at a foundation. You know, it has a separate funding stream than sexual and reproductive health services. It has a separate funding stream than incarceration funding, right? Um, so I think what we're all saying is that we've got to kind of move towards a more holistic approach to addressing the bodies of women, uh, trans or otherwise. Um, because all of this siloing is just, you know, is just not, we have not seen a reduction in gender-based violence, right? We, it, it's on the increase um, globally. So something's wrong, right? <laughs> And these, these are long-standing issues. Right, um, exactly. And I, and I know during my, my podcast episode, we talked about um, really the, the stain of slavery that, that continues today. Um, and slavery in this country created this racial hierarchy, um, this black-white binary, which yes, other people of color fall along that. And so as people get more power, it's they're, they're getting closer to whiteness. Uh, we see that with patterns of, of, of immigration, you know, in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, but that racial hierarchy still exists. And early American colonial law did not recognize violence against black people as, as a crime. Uh, our, our early laws compensated um, those that owned enslaved people. Uh, so it was like through property law, but not through criminal law. And then black women in particular, the rape of black women, that was not seen as a crime. And so we still see the underreporting, the under enforcement, the under uh, prosecution of crimes against women. Um, and, you know, looking at the statistics of, of uh, trans women that have been murdered, um, I think in 2019, like 90% of the trans women murdered in the United States were black trans women. Um, and so as Terry said, you know, the issues of, of transgendered women uh, with COVID are exponential. That's, that's true within, um, you know, the victimization of women. And, and, and we opened up talking about what makes women so vulnerable um, and unsafe is this sort of lack of access to basic needs like, like housing, um, like employment, childcare. And so these are the issues that if we worked on these structural issues, if we worked on, that would actually create more safety for women, not necessarily like increased policing. Um, because the other thing that we've seen, and this obviously um, is at the heart of, of, of the murder in, in, in in London and in, in England is a police officer's response. We, have, so we see higher rates of intimate partner violence among law enforcement officials. We see law enforcement officials reporting um, to, to a, a crisis call and often escalating violence. Um, and so, you know, increased policing, more police officers is not the answer here. It's, it's really transforming the structural forces that prevent women uh, from accessing institutions, um, healthcare, jobs, housing that would make them safer and not have to depend on others, um, an abuser perhaps, um, or some unequal power force uh, for, for the basic covering basic needs, or they wouldn't be put into vulnerable positions in which um, you know, the only sort of area of, of work and employment um, is exchanging, you know, body for, for money, which, which can create a really unsafe uh, existence for women. And as we go into like the last 10 or so minutes of this uh, conversation, I thank you for bringing that up because 
something that also has come out of London with the death of Sarah Everard is that for the first time in her vigil, white women were the ones being brutalized by police and the ones being kind of attacked and targeted by police. And it, I think it woke them up that, oh, right, the police aren't here to protect us. They protect, they're here to protect patriarchy and patriarchal society and racist society. And black women have been saying this for years. And so I just think, um, I think this also brings us back to Kimberly Crenshaw again and say her name because we've also, it's been a year now since Breonna Taylor's murder by a police officer. None of them were charged. Um, and Alexis, I know you spoke about Breonna Taylor too in your podcast. And I'm just wondering, again, this is the importance of intersectionality in terms of abolition and abolishing the police too, because we can't just approach it from a white feminist perspective, it has to encompass all uh, areas. Yeah, and, and the one officer that was charged in Breonna Taylor's murder was charged with endangering neighbors um, from, from some of the shots that were misfired. Um, I find it incredibly um, frustrating. Um, I'm angry, um, but the answer I don't think is, is you know, increased prosecution for police officers because our the, the structure, the prosecution structure was not set up to hold police officers accountable. Um, there's a fantastic scholar, Stephen Carter, that says, you know, there are um, victims and then there are black people. Uh, and, and I wanna extend that theory to, you know, there are criminals and then there are police officers. Like we don't, it's so hard for the, the legal system uh, to see police officers as 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 actors of of criminal conduct, um, and the fact that you have police officers working in tandem with prosecutors to investigate and create evidence to testify to provide evidence in you know run of the mill prosecutions, it's how then can we expect this system to hold accountable police officers? Um, and so the solution I see is something uh, larger. It's it's more structural. It's more foundational, and it has to do with really transforming the way that that we um, keep people safe, communities safe. Um, and I'm so glad, you know, you brought up um, abolition um, of policing and, and you've sort of primed us for that uh, conversation as we, we come to an end. But, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, she's, she's a geographer, um, fantastic thinker um, and scholar on, on um, abolition, abolition of the carceral state so not just policing but prisons as well and you know she really uh, stresses that abolition is not about um you know absence it's about presence uh it's about creating life affirming institutions not life annihilating um and so then it forces us to think if we eliminate police and prisons what can we replace that with if we take funding away from police and prisons how can we then best apply that funding. Um, and so it encourages us to be imaginative uh, and to build an alternate set of political, economic, and social institutions and arrangements that can then respond to so many of these social ills that we now rely on prisons and, and police to do. Um, and, and abolition, I, I, I want to make clear, is not necessarily an endpoint. Uh, you know, tomorrow we're not going to get rid of all police and all prisons, but it is a, a process. Uh, it's, a, it's a method, um, a, a praxis for change. And I think it really allows us to expansively think about what else we can do, how we wanna structure our society to best um, keep people safe and address the, the, the needs of those that are most vulnerable, which is the very population that we're talking about now, um, women and particularly women, women of color. I mean, uh, last question before we, uh, I noticed there's a question in the Q&A too, so before we turn to that, Vipu, I'd be interested to know what you think in terms of uh, intersectionality, in terms of violence against women too, because another thing that's come out of the recent deaths uh, and murders of women is this kind of phrase of she was just walking home. And it's, it's true that women should be able to walk home without worrying about their lives but at the same time if she did commit a crime or if a woman does commit a crime does that make them any less innocent or any less you know of a victim I, I think there's a problem with this phrase and I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that too yeah definitely and you know I 
just to to what Alexis was saying about incarceration in general and just kind of like how it's so disproportionate in the safety and health of people within that space is also come into question. I mean, um, so for one, to, to just like answer that question point blank, like absolutely not, it, it shouldn't matter whether someone is guilty or not. Um, the, the punishment is just so disproportionate to the crime or lack thereof um, so consistently. And I think that's a very clear cut thing. Um, and then when we think about incarceration and women's health, and you know, I don't know if um, either of you got to go to MoMA PS1 and see the exhibit that was made entirely by incarcerated people. Um, there's a video that one woman documents giving birth in shackles, like within, within the prison cell. Um, and you think about health outcomes for her, for her kid, um, and, and it's, it's baffling and now kind of multiply that times so many people who go through that. Um, and, and so we see like there are these health repercussions and repercussions that span numerous generations um, just because of one act of violence that's, that's conducted by, by a law enforcement and someone who's supposed to be keeping us safe. And um, it, to me that it's, it's just very scary. And I, I, I don't know if we can ever rebuild that kind of trust in, in the current law enforcement given this history and ongoing kind of like perpetration of, of criminal behavior against, against citizens. And we've just received a question from, I don't wanna hold you all up, so please let me know if um, you have another meeting to go to, but Yanis Silakis, uh, I'm so sorry for butchering your surname. Um, he asked, or they asked, do you think we need to address the subject of violence holistically and address violence against men, or I assume violence against women as a main source for producing violence against, oh. Um, Yes, I, I understand that question, that it's it's men who have experienced violence uh, and then perpetrate that against women. And, you know, in my class, my capital post-conviction class last night, we talked so much about trauma uh, and trauma that people encounter during their developmental years. Um, and I know my co-panelists know about the adverse childhood experiences and ACEs and the impact that can have on people's mental health and physical health. Um, but what we know about people, men, and women who have experienced violence during their developmental years, um, of course, has an impact on, 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 on their relationship formation, their response to perceived threat um, as adults. And so, um, yes, very much so. I think we need to address holistically um, violence in, in society because men, boys are on the receiving end of that, whether they experience it or they're exposed to it through their primary caretakers. And so to finish off, and Christopher asked a question that I was kind of going to touch on too, is how do we, where do we go from here? Because I think it feels like the world is kind of against women, particularly women of color. And it's, you know, it's, there's inspiring stuff, but then there's immediately something that sets you back at the same time. And so in terms of not just talking about this kind of stuff, but actually acting on it, what can we do? Um, and Vip, who I think you've done an excellent example of this with Faces at the Frontline, it's a, an online campaign that actually actively makes change. And so I think if we finish with this kind of thing, I think it would be inspiring for people watching to move ahead. And That's so sweet of, of you to say. And um, I remember in our podcast episode, we talked about how there are so many ways in which to create some kind of change because there's it's so multifactorial and pervasive um and so there are like there's awareness campaigns such as faces of the frontline such as having you know webinars like this or hosting a podcast series and then there's policy to to alexis's point of like removing barriers providing child care support services um you know, in the medical world, addressing and track, tracking the gender pay gap and creating directed campaigns to address vaccine hesitancy among women, especially minority women, um, you know, in, enhancing data collection methodologies and, and making those, you know, uniform and widespread. I think there are so many ways um, in which we can do this. And so I, I think I'd like that, like I'd like for us to end on this kind of glimmer of hope that there are small and large ways of doing things here. Um, and it's 
again, such a pleasure to be in the presence of, of both of you and, and, and you two who, who are already doing all of this um, and as a career. And, and to me, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure. And I think, you know, Vivian and Terry um, have already spoken about this, but just uh, recognizing uh, that intersectionality exists. And Terry talked about her own advocacy and work um, with individuals who are HIV positive and had AIDS and, and that we just didn't have that awareness. And I think about how much has changed, how much still needs to be done, <laughs> but how much has changed since that time. But I think having these kind of conversations and this awareness um, helps us then address through policy and advocacy. I, I agree. And I'll, I'll just say that, you know, in a somewhat poignant exchange last night in our LGBTQI and humanitarian settings class, uh, the students, all most students of color were saying, um, we're a little confused. We want to move into leadership, but, but that requires us to become more white and more patriarchal. Um, so I'm seeing students, as I'm sure we all are, that are absolutely interested in transforming and challenging and not playing anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and that is so incredibly hopeful. Uh, and of course, we always also have the arts, um, which actually are able to capture all the beauty and complexity in a way that prose and making points can never do. So I think, I think we've got to use it all, um, but there's lots to be hopeful about. It was an honor to be in conversation with you three and thank you so much for taking your time today to be here and to inspire all of us too. Um, and thank you so much. It was great to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you.